Hello, Paul Beckwith, University of Ottawa and also Carleton University. So I'm going to talk about some, um, I'm going to kind of brainstorm with you on what's happening with the jet stream. I'm going to talk about a recent paper with some new ideas by um, Jennifer Francis and Bavaris um, et al. Um, you know, just published uh, within the last uh, month or two. Um, so that basically, the Arctic's warming like crazy, equator doesn't warm so much, the temperature gradient, the temperature difference from the equator to the Arctic gets smaller, um, that temperature difference is what sets up the jet streams, so because it's smaller, the jet streams are moving more slowly, and they're much wavier, there's all kinds of vortices and stuff, as we lose Arctic sea ice, the jet stream fractured behavior will fill the entire northern hemisphere above a certain latitude. Now also thrown into the mix is that as we get more and more warming at the equator, the temperature at the surface doesn't change that much if you're over the ocean because what you do is you get more evaporation. So that heat goes into latent heat, that water vapor rises up and then it condenses in the upper atmosphere. Um, as it rises, it cools. It condenses out into droplets, forming clouds, forming the intertropical convergence zone, which is building in, uh, in, in, in uh, the, the extent of clouds and the depth of clouds. Okay, more evaporation, more, more uh, stronger ITCZ, intertropical convergence zone, the band of clouds around the equator. Um, which tracks the sun, it goes slightly in the northern hemisphere in northern summers and vice versa in, in uh, northern winters. Um, so what happens is that water vapor, when it rises up and condenses, it releases energy that heats the upper, upper uh, troposphere. The, the lower atmosphere is the troposphere, it heats the upper part of that. Okay, and that hotter temperature would then increase the temperature gradient. With the equator so then it becomes a tug of war you know is that tr temperature gradient is is the troposphere heating more the upper troposphere more at the equator than it is at the arctic and how will that affect things generally there's two jet streams so this will affect the southerly jet stream the subtropical jet stream and the arctic warming would accept, affect the polar jet stream but we're only seeing i mean can you see two jet streams here um, you know, maybe in the winter you get more of two. It's only when you do long-term averaging that you see them. Everything's so fractured now, we're in a, a different world. So let's talk about this new paper. Um, amplified Arctic warming and mid-latitude weather. New perspectives on emerging connections. Excuse me if I go into too much detail. Um, I'll just bring out the, if I, if, I'll bring out this if, uh, you know, if I, if I use terms that are too technical. Okay, the Arctic's warming and melting at alarming rates. Within the lifetime of a millennial, I like that. Okay, the, the ice is decreasing at least half. The, extent, the volume of ice, Arctic warming is two to three times out of the globe. Yes, way to go. Almost all papers say two times. You know, the high Arctic is more like five to eight times. So, you know, three times it's getting closer, getting a bit better. Okay, we reached a new record in 2016. The Arctic is only a small fraction of the Earth's surface, but it has a huge role. It's the refrigerator of the planet. So, you know, the atmosphere is complex, highly variable, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically what's happening. You know, what can we determine from the changes in the jet stream? So first of all, it's becoming accepted by a lot of scientists and you know, uh, the public is starting to understand extreme weather events are generally increasing, occurring more frequently. They're also more severe and they're also a larger duration and they're also happening in different locations in recent decades. Okay, how much can we attribute to climate change? Well, the basic physics, the earth is warmer at the equator, colder at the poles, heat tries to move in the atmosphere and oceans and it creates, because of the Coriolis force, deflection to the right, it sets up these patterns of ocean currents and jet streams. So of course, as we change that temperature differences on the planet, we change the behavior of the motion of the oceans and the atmosphere. And the pace is huge, right, in the Arctic. Um, 
So there's very clear signals. So let's have a look at, you know, let's have a look at the figures. Okay, so this is two meter air temperature, air temperature just above the surface. This is the Arctic, 70 to 90 degree north. Okay, it's relative to um, the, the 1981 to 2010 average. And what you can see is the uh, Arctic region, 70 to 90, has increased like this. And look what happened in 2016, it spiked up. So this would be on the scale 3.6 or three point, yeah, I call it 3.5, say, minus one. So we got a four and a half degree temperature increase in the Arctic. Mid latitudes, not so much change, right? Slight trend upwards, um, you could argue. Okay, now this is on an annual basis, right? But now you look at the seasonal basis and the warming is huge in the winter. Okay, so this is January, February, March, March. Okay, the red is air temperature anomalies relative to the 1980 to 2010 average, the climatology. The blue is the water vapor. Okay, so look at this. Look what's going on here. Let me try to center this. Okay, so here we have the temperature. This is um, in January, February, March. Okay, look at the red temperature spiking up. You know, we're going, this is almost, this is five, five and a half degrees from minus three degrees. That's about eight and a half degree increase in temperature in January, February, March from 70 to 90 degrees north in the Arctic. And as the temperature goes up, the water vapor goes up. Right, huge rises in water vapor in the atmosphere. The Arctic is no longer such a dry place. Okay, we're getting lots of precipitation, lots of rainfall on the sea ice and stuff. You know, you know how quickly snow melts and ice melts when you have warm rain falling on it. Okay, so this is not a good thing. So there's all these positive feedbacks in the Arctic, right? The Arctic, Arctic uh, amplification, amplified, what's AAW? Arctic, it's, it's up here somewhere. Amplified Arctic warming. I don't like that acronym. Amplified Arctic warming, strongest in the lower atmosphere. The air is expanding, right? So it changes the heights. It changes the everything in the atmosphere, not just vertical. It changes vertical motion, mixing, changes horizontal motion, changes weather and wind patterns, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, so the jet streams get wavier, they, they're slower, they get wavier. We get these strong ridges going right up to the North Pole in the middle of winter, strong troughs going right down to the equator. They don't talk about back, crazy Beckwiths that they cross the equator, right? Check out a video I did which went viral about a year ago, you know, jet streams crossing the equator and it was you know, attacked and defended and attacked and defended. And, uh, you know, the jury's still, well, I know it's correct, but, uh, you know, that hasn't, I haven't been, that hasn't come out in, in a decent paper yet that I've seen. Okay, so um, now people try to relate the jet streams to the Arctic oscillation. Um, something, you know, if, if the Arctic AO is positive, then the jet stream is supposed to be faster and tighter and less wavy confine the cold air to the Arctic. If it's positive, if it's negative, then it's much wavier. You get cold air spilling south, warm air spilling north. The AO is mostly a metric. It's not really, it's not really reliable. It's not for, you know, it's just a way of measuring the behavior. Um, one thing that is found, let me just go to the diagrams because there's a lot of, a lot of, basically the key thing is, um, the influence from lower latitudes may not be represented properly because the, you know, so the AAW is dependent on the basic state of the climate system. So the Arctic lower latitude interaction, they say it takes two to tango, right? So the Arctic is warming like crazy, right? So the, the air is expanding, right? The troposphere will be rising upwards in the Arctic. Meanwhile, but the, the, uh, 
the equator, you're also getting, because of that latent heat being carried upwards from the water vapor, it's heating the upper atmosphere at the equator. That's the other, that's the second thing. So those two effects are competing. And, uh, right, so there's, so there's uh, other, other things that are happening. You can try to explain how, there's an attempt to explain how, okay, so here's a couple things here. Okay, so this is the, this is on the Pacific, a, a parameter called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, there's positive and negative phases of it. Um, this is considered, this is sort of the initial state when it's positive. The PDO is positive. Now here, um, we talk about when there's a lot of sea ice loss in the Chukchi Sea region, then there's the distribution of the temperature of the, of the heights changes, okay? It gets warmer over the Arctic and that causes, you know, that changes the nature of the behavior of the ridges and troughs. So that changes the nature of the jet stream. And this is what happens when it's colder. So weather patterns, you know, at lower latitudes where lots of people live are being affected severely by the, the actual distribution of ice. It's not just the loss of sea ice, it's where the sea ice is being lost, right? So in some years, you know, in 2007, it was quite different, the pattern of ice left from, than from 2012 minimum, than probably from this year, which is likely to be even lower, you know, set a new record low. And that determines the pressure patterns and the, and the wind and the jet stream patterns. This is an example of, you know, there's incredible warming here. If the jet stream's here, it won't be modified much by that warming. But if the jet stream happens to have troughs here and a ridge here, then that ridge will be pulled up further by this very, very warm part of the, of the ocean. You know, so the sea ice goes, this is all open, the water heats up like crazy, it can pull up the jet stream and distort it like that. Okay. Um, this is uh, temperature anomalies um, from January to March. That those periods. This is one particular year. That's the periods when we get the most warming. Um, and you can look at uh, trends in. You can compare two different years. This 2014-15 year to a previous year, and you can see the warmer areas here. This is the equator, this is the North Pole, this is at the surface, this is at the going low, lower and lower pressures. So 250 millibar is, a, is, is a roughly where the jet streams are. Okay, and you can see the warming here. Um, warming here, there's temperature gradients that are increased, it changes the winds, etc. cetera. Um, you can see this is what's happening. This is, uh, the trend in the wind. Now, if you bring in the sea ice loss and include that in the models, you can get different distributions here. I won't go into too many details, but the point is, is that the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation has much less and less effect on these weather patterns than the jet stream does, that the jet stream changes. The, the Arctic sea ice melt is has a clamp on weather patterns compared to what the ENSO does. So it talks about what's going on in the future. You know, I'd like it to, it, it talks about new different studies. You know, there's profound changes in the climate system. The Arctic, you know, as greenhouse gases go up, the Arctic's gonna continue on this trajectory. We're losing sea ice. That's gonna completely change things. Um, there's all kinds of surprises in the works. Um, and like I say, this is, the jet stream behavior is a huge feedback which is contributing to the Arctic warming. I mean, what part of a climate change emergency are we not in? We're going into new territory. Thank you.